All right, everyone, thanks for coming today to our geospatial forum. Um, I appreciate the, the nice crowd, and I, I know there's been a series of, of meetings today. Um, so on behalf of the Center for Geospatial Analytics, we're, we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Chun Shi with us today from Dartmouth and from the Department of Geography. Um, I've gotten to know him a little today and, and looking through his work. Um, it's really interesting how, how much it like interacts with various parts of our center um, and across different departments. So both in terms of environmental exposures, things like lead and PCBs and green spaces, as well as different ways that uh, our health are impacted. Everything from ALS to tick-borne diseases to COVID-19 to maternal and child health outcomes. And so in each of these kind of environmental exposures and health outcomes or behaviors that we've discussed today, myself and I, I know some of you have been like, oh, great. Is that what you're going to talk about today? He's like, no. So, so I, I can't <laughs> wait. My oh, sorry. <laughs> so, so I can't wait to hear what he's going to talk about today. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a lot of great work. Um, he's, you know, 20, 21 years at Dartmouth uh, there in geography, coming from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and so, yeah, thanks a lot for, for joining us, um, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, yeah, again, thank you very much for the introduction from Aaron. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, not only this is a great university, great department, great center, it's really great uh, honor to be here. And also, you know, it took me three years John knows that. It took me over three years to come here. You know, finally, I'm here. It's a very long journey to come in here. I still remember the first, I received the first invitation from John that is the beginning of the pandemic. And now you can see we went through the, I went through the entire pandemic to end up here. It's a very long journey. <laughs> and another is I, I, as I, Aaron stole my, my open joke. Uh, that's not only a joke. That's a I, I, that's really serious, serious impression I got today. I had some really good meetings with people here, and after every meeting, I thought, okay, this is <laughs> something I can talk about. <laughs> and uh, from the backbone disease, dengue, malaria, tick-borne diseases, to the invasion of pathogen. Uh, species a host and the, to green space to to tourism to the environmental impact the environmental exposure uh, the only thing I don't have much to say is dancing uh, <clears throat> but then I told people I'm not going to talk about <laughs> that for that particular topic today I didn't realize I could talk about that but I also think that might be a good thing I I think uh, if I Talk about something in front of people who know better than I do, and that's just a waste. That's not worth the journey. So I try to talk about something else. Maybe you also know better than I do, but I just give it a try. Okay. Um, and also, I told John, I feel through this up to now, so far, I feel a little bit guilty. I feel a little bit imbalanced, imbalanced because I think through this visit, I learn more than I could contribute. You guys, so that I really learned a lot of things from all you guys, and uh, inspiring. I, I do see some potential down the road for the for the meaningful and important uh, collaborations down the road. And uh, even I just uh, learned that I had a great honor to meet two guys that <clears throat> make the biggest contribution to the graph software that was I'm considering to to use. <laughs> I just I had the honor to meet the two people and make the greatest contribution to that. Okay. Uh, and also this talk, as I said, I, I, it took me a long journey to come here to give this talk. And this talk, indeed, a little bit unconventional. Unconventional. Uh, first, uh, the content of this talk, I prepared for this, for this visit, constantly changed in the past three years. If I came here three years to give this talk, the content might be entirely different. And if I came here one year ago, it might be entirely different. And two years ago, it might be so, and I end up something like this. Something like this is not, and I also realized this is Friday afternoon. Uh, first, I really appreciate you are here. Second, I promise I'm not going to talk about any hard science on Friday afternoon. 
So this is, I'm not really going to talk about uh, any specific research or study in the, to the, I'm going to talk about some study, but not to the in-depth level. Um, this is mainly like uh, thinking loud. Okay? Some of the thoughts that I have been uh, thinking, and I also invite you to think along with me. Um, some, uh, something, say something here that I held pretty sure one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Now I am not that sure. Now, as I just presented here, and I invite you to think along with me. And this is one thing that is this conventional. Second, usually, you guys know that usually these kind of talk, talking about health GIS, talk about the geospace spatial analysis to the health, to the disease, to human health. Uh, usually, we start with the, the story. The story of what? With a story of Dr. John Snow. The winter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. John Snow. But I decide I'm not going to start with Dr. John Snow. That's a cliche. First, it's not only it's a cliche, but it's a shame, actually. After 150 years, when, whenever we start a talk like this, we still have to start with the John Snow. We still have another good story to tell. That is a shame. <laughs> but I, I don't know if in my lifetime I'm I will capable to change that, but the hope is there. Okay, the hope is there. Uh, okay, so I also ask John if this topic is a little bit too specific. And uh, he said, uh, maybe not, maybe or maybe not. Uh, <laughs> apply geospatial analysis to studies of infectious communicable diseases and uh, try, to, try to make it not too specific. But I want to use this as an introduction to, to introduce something broader, more general, which is the bottom-up approach in the more general geospatial analysis. Okay, so anyway, we talk about the... Uh, this topic, the geospatial analysis to the infection of the community diseases. And of course, even this topic, we can talk about many different, different things, quite different things. But today, I just started with the, what we call epidemic modeling, which to build, uh, no matter it's a mathematical model or whatever model to model, to simulate the develop, the spread, the dynamics of human to human communicable, not necessarily human to human, but anyway, it's a communicable disease. So this, but this just actually just a one, one aspect that we can use modeling, we can use geospatial modeling to, to do. And I'll, I'm going to start, I'm going to introduce this entire thing with that. And when we're through this pandemic, I don't know before the pandemic how many people know about this kind of epidemic model, not necessarily geospatial, okay? Because epidemic modeling is a pretty big research and have a long history in epidemiology, in public health. Uh, this SIR model, <clears throat> SIR model, uh, I think the first literature had published almost 100 years ago. Uh, then this is the, this is very this has a long history, and we have to start from here. Even we don't start from Dr. John Snow, but we have to start from here. SIR model. <laughs> so I don't know. I think through the pandemic, you read a newspaper, you read a research paper, you need whatever. Many people have already become very familiar with this. I just uh, kind of refresh everyone's memory. So it's also called the compartment model, which means in this model we have three compartments. It's a three big yellow circles. And basically split or divide the populations into three compartments, three different kinds of people, susceptible, infected, infected and, uh, and uh, resistant or removed. Okay? Then it describes, basically the model describes the process from the susceptible to be infected, to be resistant, mm -hmm. describe this process and uh, use certain There are certain differential equations, mathematical equations to describe this process. Uh, Chris told me if he doesn't want to show the differential equations to people and I will do the job for him. So these are the <laughs> differential equations. <clears throat> uh, I'm not gonna talk about details because I don't understand it. 
but this is the this is model. This is a model used by epidemiologists by the public health people, and uh, basically describe this process. This product, these different colors, three lines here, three curves here, different color represent three different types of people. So anyway, so this is the most, the basic, most generic, most classical models used in epidemiology, used in public health, used uh, in epidemic modeling to describe the process of uh, a communicable disease, the dynamics of a communicable disease or whatever disease. Oh, by the way, uh, I need to watch out for the time. I know it's Friday afternoon and uh, and also told the students and stuff this is i might be too relaxed here because this is not my job talk so <laughs> sometimes i can be too relaxed um but this model uh first it has some serious assumptions first it assumes everyone has the same probability to get in fact with we seen Within a compartment, within a group of people, within a population, this model assumes everyone is the same. The same means they have the same probability to get infected. Okay. And the second is assume the population is a within an area, within the population is a close one, which means it does not have the people move in or move out. Okay? And also from the geographers, from a geographer's perspective, a geographic perspective. This model assumes that within the entire area, everywhere, everywhere, not every, only everyone, but everywhere is the same. So these are some serious assumptions of this, this model. And uh, from this understanding, from this assumption, we can see that this model is non-spatial. So the classical SIR model and all its variants are non-spatial because basically it's first at the population level, it assume the entire population is a homogeneous population. Everyone is same. And second, uh, everywhere is that there's no spatial variation. So it treat the entire study area as a whole body within the study area, everywhere is the same. So if you are, your study area is a city, then the entire city is a whole body. If you is the entire state, then the entire state is a the same if the entire country, the entire country is a homogeneous entire body. And if the world and the entire world is the same. So there's no geographic variation, no spatial variation. Um, so this is assumption that also limitation of this model. Then from a geographer's perspective, <clears throat> we, of course, we have our geographic considerations. And from this book, this book is a comedy and the McLafferty book. This is textbook I used to use in my class, but now it's a little bit outdated. Uh, according to this book, our geographers consider the geographic processes of a communicable disease maybe like this. So this is spread from one center point of the epicenter to spread to a surrounding area. Follow the, we talked about it in the lunch, follow the geographic process. The geographic process is what is determined by distance and then determined by the first law of geography, right? So it's like this. And this is a contiguous model, contiguous process. And uh, another process is called hierarchical. From a more populous area, from urban area, for example, then spread to the suburban area, to the rural area, there's a hierarchical process. Of course, more often, it can be a mix, mix of these two. So these are some very generic processes or models uh, presented by geographers and in this textbook. And this totally follow our concept of geography. The geography is most important, the distance is the first law of geography. However, this might be applicable to some community disease 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, but now, We have something like this. <clears throat> Contemporary community of disease more and more show something quite different. And I call it a frog leaping. So this is this is not COVID-19. This is the this is father, the father of COVID-19. COVID <laughs> this is back to 2003. This, this is why at the beginning of this pandemic, we call this disease SARS-2, right? A certain for a certain period called the SARS. 
SARS-2. This is SARS-1 SARS back in 2003. So I don't know if you can read that, I will just read this. On 21 February, a Chinese doctor who had treated as yet undiagnosed SARS, paid SARS, Thank you very much. <laughs> so the acronym uh, is still called called by Corey, called coronavirus. Uh -huh. a similar virus, but uh, that's the that's the first generation of of this disease. Anyway, <clears throat> so a Chinese doctor who had treated as yet the undiagnosed SARS patients in Guangdong province checked in. This doctor checked into the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong within twenty four hours. 12 people who stayed in the same hotel became infected with SARS and took the disease with them to Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Ireland, Canada, and the United States, infecting directly or indirectly more than 350 people. Eventually, the World Health Organization estimated that more than 4,000 cases worldwide could be traced to this super spreader. So this one case infected people, infected 4,000 people, but these 4,000 do not follow geographic, any geographic pattern. Because people now with the contemporary uh, transportation, these people can just overnight, can from Hong Kong to the United States, to Canada. It does not follow any the patterns I described uh, in, the, in the previous slide. So this is contemporary community disease. And with this, it's very hard to model it. Okay. But anyway, um, we still try to incorporate the spatial, as a geographers, as a GIsers, we still try to incorporate the spatial consideration into this model, into SIR as, as, as model. And the one way to do that is this kind of a network. And I know many people in the audience uh, have done this. And also it's called the meta population network, which means each of these circle can represent a place or a location or an area. It can be a city, let's say, it can be a city. And within each city, within each city, we still apply the SR model or whatever is variant, but we open the population. We don't assume the population is closed. We will take into account migration, People, people's transportation from one location, from one area to the other. We can see the people move in and move out. But within each area, we still use the SR model to try to model, to try to simulate, try to predict the situation of the disease. So this is one way to spatialize, and this is so far this is the most common way to spatialize, <clears throat> to spatialize this SR, this classical. Uh, Active model. <clears throat> okay. Then there will be question here. Then, to what extent are we going to define this? Define this each area, each location. And uh, then, if we go down to the go to the stream, of course, we consider the smaller the area, the the small number of people we are going to better predict the better simulated, better model the situation of the disease. Then if we go down to the stream, we are finally, we'll go down to, to, what, to individual people, individual person, I mean. And an example of that meta population, uh, or we can call it the network of meta population network, all is this one. I participated in this research, but the main body of this research is done by some Scholars at University of Wisconsin uh, Madison, and most of these authors are from math department, and neither from geography. This one is from geography, but all the others from math department, and uh, not neither public health or geography, but the math, because this is a this is pretty complicated math, and they run on the grid on the high performance computing to run this model. So general idea of this is they treat fifty states. Basically, county viewers, uh, United States, the states, each as a as a as that circle, each as an area, and run the SR, we call it S E A I R. It's just a variant. Consider more different types of people, 
uh, um, vaccinated or reported, non-reported. At that time, there's no vaccination vaccine yet. But some that already identified, infected, or some are not reported, not not report, uh, not identified. <clears throat> anyway, so the equation is like this. So they treat each state as a location and apply this SE uh, AIR model, but they consider the migration among different states. And uh, who talked, I, I don't remember who talked about the safe graph. Safe graph, they use the safe graph, safe graph uh, uh, population mobility data to describe the move in, move out population among all 50 streets. So that's a pretty big network. 50 to 50 matrix. <clears throat> and they got some results. But this is just an example. And this is why I don't want to talk too much about the active modeling uh, about COVID-19. I, I didn't even want to talk too much about my the, the, the study I participated myself because so far, they, through this pandemic, we may have seen, I don't know, at least 100 models try to model this, this COVID pandemic, but I cannot see any one of them really did a good job. Okay, can, you, can you name one? Maybe I don't realize. So this is a really something unprecedented. We tried to, we tried a lot in public health and in epidemiology, people have tried to model. At the first I've paid attention, say model from Hong Kong, from Singapore, from Oxford, from University of Washington, Seattle, they all try to, those are some famous models, but I cannot name one that really give us a really good prediction of this. So, but anyway, so I just uh, try to use this as an example to, to talk about this meta population network model. <clears throat> so you can see the, what I just talked about, this kind of model from the most classical SR model, non-spatial, to network model, try to spatialize, but still follow the same idea of SRR, do the population base, let's do the, the uh, try to spatialize to different locations, then go to the stream. If we further go down, go down to the stream, extreme, extreme will go down to the individual lab, level model. This is individual level model is what I try to talk about today. <clears throat> and uh, if three years ago I come here, I came here to give this, I will say this with high happiness. And uh, that, that's my baby or, or baby of my group. I would really promote it after three years. I'm not that sure <laughs> actually tell the truth. Uh, but anyway, I will talk about it. So this is our idea from a geographer's perspective to understand the trend of the development of epidemic modeling, spatial temporal epidemic modeling, which is individualized and spatialized epidemic modeling. And uh, the model we developed, our group developed is called, some people already know that, they call the epidemic forest, or epi forest. Nothing really new or rocket science here is still based on some very basic ideas. Actually in very healthy epidemiology, people have used this for long, but we just try to formalize this into give it a new name. And also we try to incorporate your spatial or spatial temporal information into this to build this academic forest. The idea is not really new. Okay. But anyway, the first thing is to build the individual level of transmission chain. So basically this model try to build individual level, not population level. Okay, there's a big distinction to build an individual level transmission chains. Use a tree structure, and you can imagine why it's used. This is really uh, very intuitive. Use a tree structure to represent individual level transmission relationship like this. So this black dot refers to the, we call it in epidemiology, we call the primary case. And in some, certain, uh, in some disease, certainly like a dengue fever, if it's not local, it's not uh, from the, developed uh, from the local, then there must be imported case from somewhere else. So this indicates that imported case or primary case that start the entire epidemic, okay? Let's start from this case, then this is transmission process. Each black 
dot represent a patient, and each link represent the trans individual level transmission transmission linkage. So we use this kind of tree structure to represent the process, epidemic process of a community disease, starting from a pri primary case. Okay. Then if there's a multiple primary cases, then it's not just a tree, it's a forest. So this is why it's called epidemic forest. And this is an illustration. So there's a one, two, three, three. Dif different color represent the, the epidemic of the process uh, starting from a different, different primary case. And if we have multiple trees, then we have a forest like this in an area. This is where this name, very intuitive. Uh, but the key here, this, again, this idea is not really brand new. People have used this for long. But what is relatively new, consider our contribution is to make us some contribution to this process. How to build, how to estimate the linkage between two patients. How would you determine this link? Why this patient infect this one? Why this patient infect this one? How to build this linkage? And we use the spatial temporal information about those patients try to build this connection. That is a little contribution we made in this process. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, some technical details is in this paper. So again, the key here is to evaluate the individual level context. Uh, there, there are many different methods to do that. And in that paper, in that annals, AAG annals paper, we use a very simplistic way to estimate it with only consider the location, location of each patient and their onset time. And we calculated, we call the spatial temporal distance to estimate the linkage between two patients. That's a very simplistic way, but that's a start. And then later in the COVID-19 uh, research, we use a little bit more sophisticated because we have a little bit better data. We use uh, uh, the overlap of the individual movement trajectories like this. We evaluate the overlap of the trajectories, movement trajectories, daily movement trajectories, and we use that overlap to estimate the linkage, to estimate the strength of the contact of two patients. I will use that estimate to, to give us an idea. If, what, what is likelihood, what's the probability that this particular patient infect another particular patient? What's the linkage between these two? Okay, then there is some simple math here. I'm not going to do the detail because it's too simple. And you can make this more sophisticated. I just illustrated the idea. And uh, you guys have better math than I. Uh, and you can make this really complicated or sophisticated, but here just to use some basic idea. But general idea is during this process, we consider both spatial and the temporal trajectory overlaps and their buffers. But we consider both spatial and the temporal. And uh, we take into account information from epidemiological investigations, which means uh, if there's field the field epidemiology, which means those public health workers, they really go out to collect some information about each individuals, about their moving trajectories, about their uh, whatever um, information about their career, their, 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 their behavior, their, whatever information they collect, we can incorporate into this estimation of the, of the overlap between the two patients. Okay, <clears throat> And again, this, uh, what have, we haven't really generated a paper about this, but this is presented in an AG conference. <clears throat> so this is the, our little contribution to this. We use the available spatial temporal information about individual patients to estimate the overlap possible, possible transmission uh, connection between two patients. So this is a general idea. We, create, we basically we build a framework and that uh, depends on what information, what data available in each specific cases, you can make the methods very simple, you can make the method highly complicated or sophisticated, but this is general framework. Oops, excuse me. Uh, these are the illustration of some re real data uh, in the, in the COVID-19 study in a city in China, 
the, the city is called the Nanchang, and uh, these are some really actual actual uh, individual moving trajectory of the patients. So the, the actual data is like this. Of course, um, some political thing here is maybe political correct or incorrect thing here is uh, this kind of study is relatively easier to conduct in China because the government has a better, has a more control of the data. And if the government decide to do this, they might be able to coordinate things uh, to provide it. But of course, even in China, this kind of data is highly confidential. The use of data highly restricted. Um, so these are just some illustration. Uh, don't, don't try to trace anyone. <clears throat> And in this country, uh, things a little bit more challenging, but we we'll, we have some way to deal with that. I'll do to them later. Um, then this is an actual a case study uh, for the COVID nineteen uh, spread epidemic in Nanchang City, based on the data I just uh, presented. Uh, so in this, we build a model for the epidemic for this city, and uh, through this process. We identify a super spreader in the process. And uh, this, this one, this person, I think this one uh, initial case or primary case in fact is maybe 25 uh, descendants, I mean, and, and, and child cases. And this is distribution of this, this epidemic, all this transmission process starting from this one super spreader. Uh, you may consider that one infected 25 others may not be a too big uh, case, but consider the consider the case at that time, this is almost two years ago. At that time, this entire city only has <clears throat> only have a little bit more than 100 cases, local cases, not, not, not the cases uh, uh, imported from, from Wuhan. Wuhan is the epicenter of the entire city. There's about a hundred cases imported from Wuhan, but the local case is only a little bit more than 100. And this one single case infected 25 of that. So you can consider the super spreader. In our model, based on the available spatial temperature, based on the trajectory information, I correctly identified. And this is verified by the field investigation, which means this model, under certain condition can be effective, can be accurate. This is what I'm, the main point I try to make. Okay, then the, the purpose of construct whatever model, including this epidemic forest model, is not just to trace back, to, to review the, what happened before. The, what happened before is already, already happened, it doesn't really matter. What we try to find out is trying to use the historical data, try to get some general pattern, get some general pattern better to predict the future. So from the constructed epidemic forest model, we can extract, we can retrieve certain information. For example, we can find out each primary infection consequences of different imported cases. Different cases may have different consequences. Some infect more people, some infect fewer people. Now we can see why some cases, some primary cases, some important cases infect more, some infect a few. There might be a pattern here. So based on this epidemic forest model, we can get that kind of information. And we can also use this to identify the super spreader. And we can find out why this case becomes super spreader, why this case uh, infect more cases than others. There might be some reason for that. And uh, we, can, we can map them. We can map the coverage of each transmission process. What is spatial coverage of? And once we map this, map this, we can try to build association between the coverage of each transmission epidemic process with certain environmental factors. Why? What's the neighborhood? What's socioeconomic status? What's the natural? Uh, societal factors, we can, we can do that. Once we start to map, we can start to think along that way. And this is, <clears throat> we can also, because it's a, it's a process, which means it's not only spatial, it's also temporal. And based on the constructed uh, forest, we can map 
the coverage of different time period. And this uh, we can map what we map here is called the local reproduction. It's called the reproduction number, and in Bengali it's called the RT. And the, many people are familiar with R not. That's the, at the very beginning, the first generation. Uh, this is for for this reproduction number at the a specified a certain time period. We can name that period as T. This is really can map the dynamics of this entire pandemic or epidemic. <clears throat> and RT is a very important uh, uh, indication of an uh, epidemic process. When RT greater than one, that means this pandemic or oh, this epidemic is still developing. There will be more and more patients to appear. If this RT is smaller than one, that means this pandemic going down is, is way, it faded away. <clears throat> This RT basically is the number of child cases divided by their parent cases. So this is basically I'm saying this is a ratio. This RT is a ratio. And we can map them based on the constructed uh, epidemic forest. We can map this RT for different time periods. And we can see the pattern. We can see the change. We can see the dynamics. Spatial temporal. <clears throat> so these are the information we can extract from the constructed uh, academic forest model, and we can use this information to, to simulate or predict the future. That's the whole point. And these are some numbers of quantities uh, we, can, we, can, we can derive from the academic forest model. <clears throat> and the most important thing is something in here, the RT, for different, for different weeks and for different trees. So this, this one is for this for the entire area, and this is for we can go down really specialized to uh, individual trees. This these numbers is for the process starting from a particular primary case. Okay, uh, as I said, <clears throat> if I gave this two years ago, I will talk about it with a high confidence. And I really promote, I will really promote that. But after this entire pandemic, I'm not that sure uh, about, but this is just an idea. This is an approach. This is the, something we can explore uh, because this is highly dependent on the data availability and also depend on the study area and also on the disease. But this definitely, this is an approach we can explore. What I'm trying to do here, this is why I'm saying, I, I was saying I'm trying to, you can consider I'm thinking loud. Um, this is a big idea. I was trying to, to present it here or promote here. This kind of bottom up academic modeling system <clears throat> uh, is a little bit different from the SIR model, population model, the entire area model. But before I compare this, I, I call SIR model top down. I call it epi forest model bottom up. And before I compare this top down idea, on the bottom up idea, I want to first uh, talk about the five modules, the five, uh, five steps or five phases in this uh, epidemic forest, uh, this bottom up uh, modeling. They call it the system. This five, five modules form or construct uh, a form, a form, a, form a system. <clears throat> the first, we need to construct the individual level trajectory. Sometimes, these individual level trajectory data are available under certain circumstances, but most cases they are not available. They're not because due to the confidentiality issue, due to the data availability, availability data collection issue, due to the uncertainty issue, sometimes in most cases they're not available. Then we, we have some idea how to derive this, how to construct this. Um, then once we construct the individual level trajectory, we're going to evaluate the individual level context. Based on the trajectory information, we evaluate the overlap or the contact among or between uh, individual patients or individuals, it's just persons. And based on that, we build the individual level transmission chains, and this is FML forest, FP forest model. And based on that, we can derive characteristics of the epidemic or pandemic, just as I showed in the previous slide. And uh, finally, we can use this information 
to really simulate or predict epidemic scenarios using the derived characteristics. So these five modules, five spaces is what I consider the complete system for this bottom-up uh, model-based uh, process. <clears throat> Okay, then for the first one, for the very first one, many people will have almost 100% cases when I present this people, the first question from people is, uh, if we don't have the trajectory, individual trajectory data, what do we do? Is this model still work? Because this is indeed the, the, the bottom, bottleneck, the theory, most serious restriction for the use of this model. Uh, indeed, in 99.99 cases, that data are not available. However, we know we are in the era of we talk about the big data. Uh, we may not have that data directly available, but sometimes we can kind of extract certain information from the available data. For example, in this case, <clears throat> in this case, we do uh, receive the data. We make the make it available to us. This is data, uh, the cell phone data, the cell phone data from the cell phone carrier a cell phone carrier co a company in, in China, they could not, due to, even in China, they could not give us the individual level cell phone data. But what, the, but they still provide us, the, the data is like that. The data is, they develop the area into a certain grade. This, each grade is 500 by 500 meter by 500 meter square, okay? And they cannot give us individual level, but they can give us uh, for certain days, for each hour during a period, say 30, 30 days, maybe even longer, it depends on uh, how much, the, how, how, how large that you can handle. For a certain day, during a certain hour, how many people moved according to their cell phone signal, move from one gray cell to another gray cell. They can give us this data. And this is a little bit similar to the safe graph data. Safe graph data may can, can in this country, and the safe graph is a company about the mobility data, the population mobility data in this country, they make their data available, especially during the pandemic period. This data become really popular for many researchers. And they provided a different resolution. And the most available data may be at the county, county level. And they, they can tell you during a certain period in certain days, how many people move from one county to another county according to their cell phone signals. And if you have a good relationship with them, they can provide even more details data like to the weekly or maybe even daily, but depends on how your relationship with them. <clears throat> okay. But this one, this is, this is a China data that is for this 500 to 500 square uh, for each hour. We know how many people move from one cell to another cell. Then we develop the process, very simple process to try to estimate, try to derive the individual level trajectory. The process is like this. We know during a certain hour, how many people from this cell to one, two, three, four, four different, <clears throat> for different, different cells. And maybe some people stay in this cell. So basically we have this data. Then we calculate, say how many people would not, what is the percentage, what is the proportion of people from this big N, which is originally in this one, move to this one? That's M1. Then this small N1, lowercase N1, over this big N, we consider this as a probability. Then same thing, we consider, well, this is the number of people stay in the, in the cell, they didn't move. And this is the number of people move to this cell. This is the number of people move to this cell. So we can calculate the four proportions, four percentage. And we use this four percentage as the probability to estimate what is the, how likely a particular person move from this one to this one during this hour. Or the probability move from this one to this one. Or the probability this person just stay, didn't move. Okay, then there's a stochastic process. So we randomly choose the next cell for a particular person in the next hour based on these probabilities. Then we repeat this for the next hour, repeat this for the next, next hour. 
then in this process, through this process, we construct a possible, just a possible, a possible trajectory of this person during this day, through these hours. So this is not rocket science, right? Pretty simple idea. Okay. So this is how we, this is a very initial preliminary work. We use the big, try to use big data population level data to try to derive the individual level trajectory. This derived trajectory may or may not be the true. And uh, Chris will tell me, you should use Monte Carlo. And indeed we use, we use the Monte Carlo to, to, to <coughs> evaluate the uncertainty here. We run this many, many times. So this is, and not only that part, actually all through these five uh, phases, there's always uncertainty there. There's uh, many parameters in this, in this five phases process. Each of them will have some parameters. We, we don't have deterministic values for the parameters. So this entire process can be a stochastic process. And uh, we run this many times. Then we can, each time we can get a different, different, trees, different forests. And these different forests represent uncertainty in our data, uncertainty in our knowledge, uncertainty in the parameter values. Okay, okay then to address those uncertainty, <clears throat> I just showed that, uh, just one example. We use the big data to, to derive the uh, downscaled individual level data. But in this process, we developed this idea. This is a process that we can integrate different types of data. Now, I know everyone is talking about big data that become a fashionable. However, this is a situation, and I consider this as a really showcase that only big data is not enough. This process, this epidemic modeling, this bottom-up approach needs to integrate small, medium, medium, and, uh, and big data. I don't know if someone uses small, small data or medium data, this or not. I know everyone is using this big data, but I consider uh, this is a showcase that and I think this applies to many different studies, not only for the epidemiology or uh, disease matter. <clears throat> in many cases, we should integrate these, all the information we have. And by small data, I mean, in this particular case, contact, within this particular context, I mean accurate, precise, and specific data. And they provide a special information, special information. And, uh, they are expensive and difficult to obtain. And uh, because they're expensive and difficult to obtain, uh, they usually have a very small sample size. And for example, within this context of a, within a context of epidemiology or, or, or disease mapping or epidemiology, it can refer to genetic biomarker data or some behavior experiment data. I know some people here uh, run studies for you, you recruit some volunteer, a small group of volunteer, and put the GPS device on them and then let them you collect their trajectory, you collect the information on daily daily trajectory. There's a this kind of study that become more and more popular within the GIS as within the uh, in the human geography or, or uh, this is but no matter how many volunteers you recruit, this is I still consider. Because it's really expensive, not expensive, not not only the budget, not the monetary budget, but also you go through a lot of paperwork, a lot of paperwork, and a lot of other other expense. So it's it's almost impossible to collect, say, two thousand. This is a uh, sometimes the most typical uh, sample size is the fifty to six people, two hundred people. That that I think that's the biggest one I've ever seen. Okay, but. They provide very accurate, very specific, whatever you want to collect. But they're, the, the only problem is they, they're usually pretty small. And this shows the, the example of we including our proposal. This is the evolution. And Meredith, you can tell me more about that. This is the evolution of the virus stream. <clears throat> so 
So these are the collected from some dengue patient, influenza patients. So they provide some, some bio, bio samples and uh, run through some expensive uh, lab analysis and try to build uh, the, this, this is called the evolution tree to find out the generations of the, the virus evolution. And based on this information, we can find out, we can estimate which particular patient is infected by which particular patient. So this is this might be so far the most reliable information we can figure out who infected whom. Of course, there's also uncertainty involved, but so far this might be the most reliable way to, but of course, this is very expensive data. So I call this kind of data small, small data. <clears throat> The medium data. <clears throat> medium data is data of particular subject. For example, all the patients, all the, the COVID-19 patients, all the dengue patients, all the malaria patients. Uh, and uh, they still at the individual level. And uh, they have medium sample population size through the epidemiological investigation, through the public health workers, uh, their, their, their work. And for example, spatial, temporal, demographic, socioeconomic behavior and the symptom data of individual patients. Through the certain, we call the field investigation, we can collect the, this kind of data for a certain group of people, like the, most typically the patients. <clears throat> and big data. Big data is what we call the data about the population and can be used to derive individual level data in a large sample or entire population. This is data about a large group of people or even about the entire population of a city, the entire population of the state, the entire population of the country, depends on how large you want it. Um, for example, moving trajectory data of population in a city. And then now people, uh, very popular to use the social media data, Twitter data, cell phone data, taxi data, uh, the subway car data, that kind of data. Um, I call those data big data. And here is an example of integration of the three types of data. <clears throat> So we start from here. This is uh, the data we, these are patient data. We collect through the epidemiological uh, investigation. So this can be the patient data of certain disease. And we sample some of them because we, we not afford to sample everyone. We sample, we collect some biomarkers, we collect some, uh, some specimens from some of them and do the lab analysis, get the virus strain, we call the small data. And from this data, we can build this kind of thing, this kind of transmission, infection, or relationship among small group of people. And we use this one as we split them into the testing set, uh, into a training set and a test set. And we use to apply this training set and uh, these information from this group. This is a medium data. This is small data. It's a medium data up here. We, try to build a model between these two, build the relation between these two, because our purpose is to use these factors, these residential location, onset time, activity trajectory, so on and so forth. We try to use this medium that relatively cheaper and easier to obtain, try to predict this, but use this one as the information source to try to build an associate between these two then, if we can build a model between these two, we can use this to predict this. Then we use the test set to verify this, to estimate the uncertainty, estimate the accuracy, and so forth. That way, yeah, this one also from the big data. Some of these variables are directly from this. Some of these we need to do, for example, trajectory. We, we may, may or may not have a trajectory of all the patients, but we can use the big data to derive trajectory that also make contribution here. From the big data, we'll make contribution here. Um, then once we train the model to get the get this uh, individual level active forest model, individual transmission model, we can apply this to the big population to try to predict or model the scenario to the scenario analysis. 
So this is the integrate, uh, this example of integration of the three types of data. Uh, so this is our idea. <coughs> Just very quickly go through. So I'm not just talking about the theories, principle, concepts. We really have developed a software, and uh, we also the software, the programs, the code have been implemented, have been finished on the on the desktop on ArcGIS, based on ArcGIS, and the the software is called ArcGIS. Well, advertisement here. Arc. Arc, not Arc, yeah, Arc helps. <clears throat> Arc helps. That is the Arc helps itself is a is a pretty big software package. And what I'm just talking about is academic modeling, academic forest. It's one part, one component of it. It can also do environmental health, uh, cluster detection, and uh, some other things. It's a general thing. It's called it. General package is called Arc Health and it's run as an extension of ArcGIS Desktop. And uh, currently, we are migrating to ArcGIS Pro. And also, we have partially migrated to this. Maybe many of you have heard about this this term called a Cyber GIS. Cyber GIS is terminology invented by some people in uh, UIUC, and basically, it's high performance computing. High performance computing GIS is a platform. It's a platform to uh, facilitate high performance computing to handle big data, the intensive computation. And this is a platform run. This, this entire project, the CyberGS project, this idea is sponsored by NSF. NSF has invested, um, invests quite a lot, multi million dollars to build up this. Um, so, this, what I just talked about at the forest, that's the five, five phases. Components have been partially implemented. We're still working on that. <clears throat> so this is the interface of the Cyber GIS uh, homepage. And many of you may already know this is now it become the more and more fashionable to use this Jupyter notebook. And we implement this. We try to migrate this from the desktop to the Linux Jupyter notebook. Uh, this is the very initial page for the Jupyter Notebook we created for that five phases uh, process. And then we have these, these modules here. So uh, disaggregate trajectory data, evaluation trajectory overlap, and then building active forest and extracting technical features and simulating scenarios. <clears throat> so these are the five modules I just talked about. Uh, so far at this time, we have implemented and uh, tested uh, these two. Uh, these two, building academic forest and extracting academic, for, uh, academic features. And for testing, for people to test uh, this, we provided a test uh, data set, individual, individual uh, movement trajectory data. We provide a test data of that with an illustration of the test data set. And this is the interface of this, I think the third module, the value trajectory overlap. And uh, this is output from this module overlap matrix today. And this is the interface of the fourth module building at the forest. And this is the output from this. Actually, this is a representation of the academic forest. Okay, finally, some message I'm thinking loud message uh, top down and the bottom up. <clears throat> All those I just talked about some specific things, and uh, I told you uh, I have been uh, went through some thinking process, but finally, I still hold this for sure. For sure, top down versus bottom up. <clears throat> so I consider the SIR model and all its variants like a, as a top down approach. And top down, top down, the general features of top down approach is that seeks to first establish global or general models or laws that then apply them to the entire problem. 
they, for example, the entire geographic area, entire city, entire state, entire country, entire world, and uh, entire time temporal period, and uh, and the entire population. So this is what this kind of approach trying to achieve. You the we call the global or general problem problem solver problem model, and that it assumes each local space or individual subject is a substantiation of the global general models for loss. Then the success of Newton's theory, back to the classical science, the success of Newton's law in physics encouraged and eventually defined the top-down methodology for sciences such as physics, chemistry, biology, um, that feature experiments in condition-controlled labs. And the global general models or laws can be in the form of a set of differential equations or even statistics models, artificial neural network or decision trees. <clears throat> so all those can consider, even if they can, they are data driven, but finally you have a set of equations, you have a regression model, you have neural network, there's still a general model, a general problem solver. And you apply this general problem solver to specific question. <clears throat> so this is what I consider a top-down approach. The limitations of top uh, approach, the assumption, they have the assumption of a controlled conditions. And uh, they try to achieve a simplification through deduction and uh, induction. And uh, they very frequently they are deterministic to assume clear cut boundary. Yeah, as GI search, we know what that means. Clear cut boundary, even distribution. Uh, rational behaviors of human and uh, no error in the data. And uh, ironically, ironically, this kind of model usually are complicated and uh, delicate because they try to achieve the generality. They try to be general, make the self complicated and whatever, whoever complicated, it can be delicate. It cannot handle too many exceptions. So here's a statement from Brom and then his colleagues. A geographic processes such as diffusion of disease, wildfire spread, ecological evolution, transport, and the residential development, urban dynamics, and the land use change are usually highly complex. So a lot of the things we do in geography and ecology in public health are highly complex and often include the nonlinear and the emergence, emergence phenomena, statistic components, feedback loops, and the multiple equilibrium over various spatial and temporal scales. When characterizing or simulating those phenomena, small randomness may lead to a great deviation in the resulting path. That's called chaos, right? <clears throat> because of feedback effects. And bottom up, then the bottom up, the other way, bottom up does not seek to build a global general model beforehand. Instead, it builds relatively simple rules that characterize local situations and individual properties and behaviors, as well as their interactions, which means rather than build a general model about the entire population, we just try to try to model the interaction between two individuals, two individual persons. It then applies these rules to local spaces or individuals, and this application may run repeatedly to mimic the real world progression or evolution. And it is expected that global or general patterns of or phenomena emerge. It's very important word emerge from this process. And typically, implementation includes cellular automata and agent based modeling. And the epigma forest. The motivation for implementing a bottom up approach is the geographic problem of phenomena are often too complicated to be characterized by global general models. And most, if not all, complex phenomena are eventually outcomes of local simple phenomena and their interactions and the complex phenomena at the global general scale can be modeled by applying simple rules to local spaces. Or individuals. Some characteristic or maybe advantage of bottom up modeling 
local spaces and individuals and modeling stochastic processes and modeling interactions among local spaces and the individuals and modeling progression and evolution and modeling based on simple rules. Summary. <clears throat> I'm not just to promote the bottom-up approach. I consider through this three-year pandemic, I realized uh, they both have advantages and disadvantages. So the top-down and the bottom-up approach can be complementary, supplemental, and supportive to each other. And the bottom-up approach is facilitated and motivated by increasing available big data and uh, computational capacity. And the risk, of course, we have this restriction to access individual level data the Quality issues of big data are a bottleneck in the bottom up approach. And the conceptual framework and the technical process of the bottom up approach are still under developing. This is research and great attention. Okay, these are acknowledgments, those people who made contribution on this idea and some seed money for this. And you can see this is why I think this is uh, thinking loud because we haven't got a major fund major grants to really pursue this, only some seed money from internal funding, but I, I see this is a, some area that uh, deserves more investigation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Am I too relaxed? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I know we're at time. Um, I'll take a burning question or two and then um, he doesn't play out. Yeah, you can you can contact. Yeah, I really so we can certainly say I could hear something back. Mm -hmm. The best way to improve what model? <laughs> what is DVD model? I would say both. Yeah, of course, the data, um, the data is the, is critical. If you don't have the data, you cannot really do any anything. And uh, also. <clears throat> Uh, I, I, I said I, I would not entirely just promote a bottom-up approach, but the, I can see that a certain scale and a certain condition bottom-up approach does have its advantage. So whenever that is proper, I would say bottom-up approach may be a way that you want to try, but of course that also depends on the data availability. The data quality definitely that's, that's an issue. Yes, uh, and uh, yeah, both, both data and the approach. Uh, I, I, I know I may not fully answer your question. I, I actually, you may have your own concern that I, we don't have time to really get a really in-depth discussion, but you're highly welcome to send me an email to really talk about what you're thinking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> it's not a short question. Yes. <laughs> so please make safe but very unpredictable and random decisions is so that no one knows what is going on with where you are, why you are there, and how that then exposes you to other things. Um, thank you for, for your yeah, talk. Thank you. Yeah, it's gonna make it terribly difficult on social scientists because the behavior just can't be explained. <laughs>